Good morning. Welcome back. Late night of delicious food. I hope you all got some rest. I hope you had a good time yesterday, and I'd like to welcome you back to our second day of our third annual Food for Tomorrow conference. Before we get going with Miss Martha Stewart, I'd like to thank our sponsors again, Oppenheimer Funds, Cornell Douglas Foundation, and the Kroger Company for supporting this conference along with the Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture. Now I'd like to introduce you to someone. Ms. Martha Stewart. Hi, everybody. Hi, Martha. Hi, After, ooh. Thank you. Have a we seat. already did that. We did it, but we're doing it again. <laughs> we're doing it again. Now, um, you guys are all documenting this on social media, I see. Um, we're documenting it on social media as well, using Facebook Live, which is a, a, a thing that you've quite taken to, Martha. Well, yeah, they, uh, Facebook came to us as a, as a beta tester. And uh, we've been doing Facebook Live for um, quite a few months now. And it's worked amazingly well, because you can create an entire television program with a handheld Apple 6 Plus, or now the new 7, and um, no, no, nothing else. Right, no cameras, no No cameras, crews, no lights, no, no yeah. nothing. And it's so fun, and we've been interviewing people, we've been doing cooking lessons, we've been doing all kinds of stuff, and reaching somewhere around a half a million to a million viewers on Facebook Live. So it's, uh, and I thought it was all brand new and everything, and then I went to China last week, and uh, we're, we're reaching like a million viewers on Facebook. Um, did an Alibaba thing, mm -hmm. 440 million. <laughs> and they've been doing it for years. They have just an in-house network that goes to their 440 million people. So it's all, what it, what's new is new. What's new is new. Let's, uh, but I'm a journalist, so I'm gonna start in the past. It seems to me, Martha, that there's, this is gonna sound ridiculous, but you gotta take it. You have to take the praise. There's probably no living person who has done more to raise up the middle class aspirations of, of America. You've provided through countless deals this ability for Americans to take on your aesthetic and with it a degree of self-confidence about themselves and about their lives and about their cooking. Now with this Alibaba situation, you're gonna do it in China? I hope so. I, and, I, and I don't mean about I don't mean to impose my aesthetic so much as develop individuals' aesthetics, give them the confidence to um, say, "Oh, I have a living style. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I did, but I do." And I like I know I like postmodern this, or I like uh, Victorian, or I like uh, country. Uh, it's it's just giving people confidence in themselves and in their own determination to make their everyday lives nicer. But of course, these cultural touchstones are different in China than here. Well, they are. They're very different. But um, but I think uh, I uh, first of all, I, I, I'm I'm very uh, interested in Chinese lifestyle. I always have been. I read every Pearl Buck novel when I was a little kid, and um, and from then on, I, I I love the cuisine. I love um, every. I love the art. Um, and so, it's not that I'm a big expert, but I think that I can adapt uh, my philosophy of, again, giving confidence and giving uh, credibility to a nicer way of living to uh, a vast growing uh, middle class in China. Right now, um, the, the estimates are that in five more years, the, the, the middle class will approach uh, about 400 million. That's a huge middle class <laughs> compared to, say, America's. And, uh, and, they, and they need content, they need uh, inspiration, they need information, and uh, maybe, maybe I can help. I, well, I, I, don't, I, I don't say I'm gonna be it, because there's plenty of other people that can do such a thing, but I can help. Let's talk a little bit about inspiration. We all know something about how, how we teach and how we learn, but what's more mysterious and ineffable in your case is how you are providing inspiration to this small audience, to our Facebook Live audience that's much wider, to 400 million middle class Chinese. Where does inspiration come for you? Well, um, I live kind of an inspired life. I get up with the chickens. I looked out this morning. I said to myself, gosh, I don't see anything but green when I look out the window. And I commute from the country to the city. I live in Bedford. 
and I, I, made, I made a concert, a concerted effort to not live in New York City. I have an apartment. I think I've slept there in the last 20 years, maybe 200 times in 20 years. Because I like going home to the animals. I like going home and picking a head of lettuce and a tomato and eating it uh, for supper. I, I really like going to the country and getting that, that uh, detox from the city. So, um, so I, I, um, I get inspired by uh, visiting other places. Um, two weeks ago, I was in LA for a whole week getting inspired. Then last week, I was in China for four days getting inspired. Uh, I get inspired just going, I just get going anywhere, coming here. I, I can't wait to get in the greenhouse. We're going to do a Facebook Live with Nick Algieri in the, uh, in the greenhouse here, uh, talking about uh, greenhouse growing year so, round. But again, it's ineffable. I get inspired. And I'm interested in the, in, in the technique of that, because I, I heard once that you won't take the same road twice over the course of a day oh, or going down the my same driver. street. Uh -huh. Drivers, <laughs> drivers, Driver, well, plural. I have to have more than one because I, I have a very long day and you're only allowed to have a driver for 40 hours a week. So I have four drivers add that up. <laughs> it's a joke, but um, <laughs> but it's, you can get a reporter for longer than that. But it's uh, but they can, but, you know you can't get them too tired because you you worry about them crashing if they're <laughs> if they're uh, they've worked too many hours. So um, no, so it's it's like I don't want to go down the same street, and especially in New York, I hate going down the same street twice, uh, especially in a week because I and. The last, a couple of weeks ago, I was on some new street, like 37th Street or something I hadn't been on for a while. And there I found the whole store devoted, an entire store devoted to wheels. Wheels. <laughs> and I went in, I jumped out of the car and went in, and I've been looking for special casters for some old office chairs that I have. As one and does. There they had, <laughs> there they had the casters that I needed and wanted, and you can find them online, but you'd have to, you know, physically, I, I had to see if they were the right size and everything. So wait, Martha, to be clear, you get out of the car. Oh, I do. Wait here. Yep. And go into or just go around wheels. the block if it's no parking. Uh, I don't want to get a ticket. <laughs> and um, and so uh, they go around the block and wait for me. And I got the catalog and I, I learned all about wheels. And now we're going to do a whole article on wheels for the magazine because wow. that's another way to get inspired. Uh, I'll say. Don't you do that? Yeah, that's how I found just bulbs. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Martha, one of the things we've been talking about. Um, the over Bronx the is even better. Oh, Bronx is up. The better. I found down. a hardware store in the Bronx just recently. Oh, the best. Special issue? The best hardware store you've ever seen. Old timey? Oh, well, it's old timey, but all new timey stuff inside. And it's and gigantic. It's a where you know a hardware warehouse. And um, what were you doing driving around the Bronx? Well, I'll tell you about Marley, Martha, and Marley's when we have our we have oh, our that's commissary where, there. So you see, you you're yep. bringing me to exactly where I wanted to go, which <laughs> is that we've been talking a little bit about meal delivery services and and their role in our lives moving forward, and whether they're cooking or not cooking, their convenience, or their aspiration, what they are. And here you have gone uh, into partnership with Marley Spoon. Yes, we have, um, and it's uh, it's very exciting, um, and especially after, uh, I think it was yesterday's announcement of Blue Apron, and you're going to have uh, Matt here, uh, I think, in, the next, in two, more, two more talks this morning, mm -hmm. right? Max Holzman, and he's going to talk about Blue Apron and, a, and an IPO offering of about, valued at about $3 billion for a new young company. Uh, but, uh, but I think that it is a, a very exciting way to think about meal preparation for the everyday family. Um, and I think that, uh, and my idea of, of for, Marley, for Marley Spoon is uh, that we, and it's the same idea that I had with the, with the internet, save time to make time to do other things. Um, because we spend so much time going to um, the stores trying mm -hmm. to find inspiration and, and the foodstuffs for our daily meals. Uh, when we could really be home cooking uh, if everything were provided for us. We also waste a lot of money, and, and I'm not against the supermarkets, okay? We, we're not going to eliminate supermarkets, but it does take on the supermarkets, these meal kits, in terms of everyday foodstuffs. Um, because what the meal kits do, and I'm sure everybody in this audience has tried, you have chef uh, right now. We've tried all your all your boeuf bourguignon and the more expensive. How'd that work out for you? Um, fine. Good. Fine. fine. Yeah. Martha and, Stewart. Um, fine. <laughs> 
I'm in the wind. I only got to taste the boeuf brignon, but Thomas, how did the other things taste? They were good. Wow, it's getting they better. <laughs> <laughs> we're saving the superlatives for Marley's food. <laughs> so, um, so uh, but what it does is, I mean, if you think of a, a five or six hundred billion dollar industry, which is the grocery store industry in America, and you think of the hundred and sixty billion dollars of waste from those grocery stores, you start to feel a little bit bad. Well, do we feel a little bit bad about the waste that, and every meal delivery service company is wrestling with this, with the waste that comes with the packaging? Well, we've been trying very hard to eliminate uh, a lot of uh, bad packaging. So um, there's not much bad in a cardboard box uh, with, um, with brown paper bags inside and small, small, uh, mostly biodegradable containers. Not all are biodegradable. You can't, um, and, and it, we were struggling with how to ship the raw eggs. And uh, because you want to be able to give eggs to people, good organic uh, eggs if possible. So there's, uh, there is the packaging problem. But weigh that against the gasoline it takes to go to the grocery store, uh, the, um, you buy a bag of onions instead of the one onion that you need for the dinner tonight, and then the other onions might start to sprout in the kitchen in a, in a few days. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, pros and cons, but mostly pros for meal kits. Okay, so now imagine that we're with Snoop. Maybe we've had some edibles. We're just hanging out in Bedford. And I say, Saving time to make time, it's delicious, but isn't that like a TV dinner? Not at all, because a TV dinner, you just pop into an oven. This, you have to learn how to cut. Oh, there's chopping? Of course. Oh, we're not chopping for you. <laughs> None of the meal kits are chopping for you. So it's not dump and stir. No, it's not. It's and just it's not the at ingredients. All. It's a very nice recipe. Uh, and, and I've tried all the meal kits, and they're all, I think, uh, excellent in the, in the way that they present the, the finished dish in a photograph, uh, a good recipe, uh, good ingredients. And, uh, and you learn not only techniques, because you have to learn. I mean, there are a lot of people who don't know how to chop an onion. We've been having a series of um, dinners at our, at our offices, inviting bloggers and, and uh, journalists to come in. And I must say, I hope none of you are in the audience. I must say, I was quite surprised, taken aback, that so many don't know how to cut up an onion nicely. They don't know how to Kim peel a carrot. <laughs> They can learn. I, I'm all for learning. I'm all for teaching. The new motto that we have now, teach me to learn. Ooh, and that's a motto that comes from Snoop, Snoop. no? Snoop, Snoop coined it last week Incredible. while we were filming Snoop. our new program. And I, I told Sam about the new program. It's very fun. And we're going to be teaching a whole new uh, audience, I hope, uh, the, the, the rappers and the, and, the, and the upwardly mobile whatevers, um, to new techniques. Excellent. And young people. Young people want to learn. Kids want to learn. Look at the attention kids are paying to, to Chopped. I yes, know. and to all sorts of And I, I went on shows. the Kids Chopped or whatever. I can't remember what it's called. I was so depressed. Toddler Chopped? No, well, it's, it's, kids, it's young people Chopped. I was, um, I was really depressed because I hate chopping children. I, you know, it's not, yeah, it's yeah. not terribly nice. Does it get easier? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just couldn't stand to see them cry and, and flake out. And uh, it's, like, it's like Miss Universe. You know, you tell Miss Universe bad things, and look what happened to her. <laughs> and uh... We're making news, folks. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a question from our Facebook Live audience, because it's through. sort of awesome. Oh, good. What's the worst thing you've ever cooked? This is Mindy Hervey asking, your greatest cooking flop, like real misery. You'll never do it again. Um, I, well, the, the very worst was my first Thanksgiving, and I was in... Take us back to that I time. I was in Guilford, Connecticut, in a little farmhouse with an electric oven, and um, my husband's family was coming, and my family was coming, so there were about 20, 19 or 20 people coming for my first Thanksgiving. Been there. Gotzi's Turkey Farm was down the road, uh, luckily. 
Um, and I had bought a 35 pound turkey. It just fit in the Holy oven. Holy cow. And I, I figured the timing out and I had to get up at, at like five o'clock to turn the oven on and get the bird in. And, um, and I asked my husband to preheat the oven. He got up and I was doing, I don't know what I was doing, peeling carrots or something. And he uh, turned it on broil and I didn't check. And I put the turkey in and we went back to bed to awake to a house at 8 o'clock or 7.30 or something to a house full of black smoke. And the turkey had completely blackened. Who knew that that's pretty good for a turkey? And, uh, and I, I was about to throw the turkey out. I, we put it out on the porch and we ran down the road to the Gotsi's turkey farm, which was really just down the road. And they were packing up to go to Florida and they had one turkey that was not quite frozen in their, in their uh, cooler. And I, I took that back home. It cost you know another I don't know fifty dollars, and um, s took the stuffing out of the old one and put it in. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was okay. And uh, <laughs> we ate we ate about three hours late, and everybody was a little depressed. But that was the worst. That is a good story. So I and then the turkey funny. under the black skin. Then then I find out that that I think it was Town and Country magazine or one of those f fancy magazines had actually a recipe for blackened turkey that you make out of soy sauce and all kinds of uh, dark. Not dark. for you. And uh, no, my, my friend Jane Hiller cooks it every single year, the black turkey. <laughs> Um, another Facebook question, and then we're going to go back to okay. my questions. Um, Gabrielle Ruffino asks, in contrast to that miserable failure, what was your, what's your triumph? Best dish ever. Um, well, that's hard to, hard to say what the best best is, but um, I had to cook dinner for Roger Verger at my house. He was a friend that my husband was publishing his book. And, um, and, uh, and was a, you know, he's such an amazing chef. And they just had a dinner in his tribute um, two weeks ago in New York. Um, but, um, I, and I didn't know what to make for Roger Ferger. And I and I had never been to his restaurant but at this time. This is a long time ago. And so I cooked him a Polish dinner. And I made pierogi and potato and cabbage. And I made, um, uh, some pickled um, jellied pig's feet, which is called stujolina. I just made ethnic dish dishes that I had learned from my mother and grandmother, and he loved it. Nice. And you, all you really want is whoever's eating to love. That's a success. You can do that with an egg. Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, I'm looking up at the time. It's like, it's, it's like we're falling in love. It's, it's going like that. <laughs> and I want to make sure to get some questions from, from you guys. So why don't we um, open the floor just for a moment and see where we're at. I'm sure you have some questions for Ms. Martha Stewart. No, I've got plenty. Oh, there's one. Yes, ma'am. How do you see your, um, your fan base or your consumer base, how do you see their, their tastes and their preferences changing over time? Well, I think that uh, as all of us are, are sitting in this room thinking about more plant-based diets, more, more, more um, conscious eating habits, I think that that's happening uh, with, uh, with our, our fan base, if you want to call it that, or our readership. Um, and I think that uh, people are paying a lot of attention to the sustainably grown. Uh, they're reading the books that, uh, that so many of us are reading nowadays, paying attention to, uh, to uh, how animals are raised. After, after I saw Food, Inc. Um, and read Eating Animals, um, my habits changed. I have not, since, since I read Eating Animals, I have actually, and, I, and I'm very conscious about the way animals are treated. I treat my animals like, like my best friends. And they are fed so beautifully and the results are so delicious. Just one bad day. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just amazingly, um, amazingly. That's right, that's all they have. Uh, as we have only one bad day, hopefully. Um, but, but it's, and the taste is so different. And when I, when I went and bought some chopped meat for my dogs at the uh, supermarket and just touched it and got all greasy uh, from whatever and red, my hands were red and greasy, I have, no, I have not bought chopped meat ever again, and 
anywhere, actually. I chop my own. So but what's interesting about the plant-based diet that the questioner asked is you got a prop there. Let's oh, yeah. show it. It's your new yeah, book the new, on the vegetables. The newest book. And uh, it's, it's fascinating because it, there's, there's no moralizing to it. It's simply presented uh, fait accompli. Here are the recipes you want to cook. And I wonder, I wondered suddenly, is that part of your technique? not to moralize, but simply to say, this is what Martha says, and the world follows? We're not, we're not um, proselytizers, we're not preachers, we're teachers. This book is a really good primer, or, or advanced primer, uh, on the art of cooking vegetables. And there's not, there is meat in here, and there's fish, but, uh, but it's basically vegetable-based, the way that we would like um, to think our diets are, are, are veering towards a vegetable-based diet. So it's um, it's so teaching is our forte. Mm -hmm. um, all my editors would agree with me. We have our book editors sitting right here. Would you agree with me that teaching is is what we're we're oh, yeah. doing? Oh yes, ma'am. Ellen Morris. Oh yes, ma'am. <laughs> Says Alan's like, yep, definitely. <laughs> and for as many books as you want. Yeah. Well, this this is this is the eighty seventh teaching book that we have published in, at Martha Stewart, eighty seventh, and that's a lot for twenty five years of. Of, That's of, a lot, period. Yes. Let's get a question on this side if we can. You're so shy in her presence. Good yes. Time. Thank you. So as, as you think about teaching and about changing and enabling people to change their habits, how do you take that from what could be perceived as an elitist approach to one that really affects the diets and of, of the total population and their behaviors? Well, um, again, we're not elitist in any way. Um, it's just not the way we are. Um, I, I totally appreciate um, the way people, people are. Uh, the business that I've built has been based on uh, sort of um, inclusivism, <laughs> if that's such a word. I don't want to be a Donald Trump again. But, um, <laughs> but, I, but we want to include. Um, so when I went with my first product line was at Kmart which was considered by many elitists as really down market. Um, but I wanted... Help me out in my first apartment, though. Big did, time. Did it? Oh. Still have them. Yeah, see, and, and I... Except for the place. So, so we've been continuing to make uh, products that are as useful and as good looking and as um, innovative and as, um, as um, sustainable as we can possibly make, but at aff affordable prices. Because it's, again, it's my whole thing about saving money so that you can save money to take your kids on a vacation. You know, you can spend $500 on a sheet set, but you can also spend $100 on a sheet set and then have $400 left so that you can go to Disney World. So, um, so that's the, really the way that I have been thinking my whole life. And I grew up in a family of six kids, uh, a very small uh, family income, um, and, um, and we ate well. We ate amazingly well. We uh, learned a lot. We all went to college. We, you know, we were we were what I consider uh, the the um, the most of America. What what were those family meals? Were they heavily Polish meals or no, super no, no, American no, no. meals? No, my, mo my mother my mother was an amazing cook, but the treats were the Polish food. We love, Pol but that's time consuming. Yeah. So um, so we had a large garden in our yard. We lived on a fifth of an acre, but behind our house was a great big field where the neighbors all broke it up into like almost like victory gardens, but it was post-war, of course, and um, so we, uh, we grew other things. But we had a large chest freezer in the basement. Uh, we had um, a pantry filled with wonderful canned tomatoes. Everything that wasn't eaten fresh was preserved. And, uh, and I still preserve. I, I've been uh, making tomato sauce um, like by the gallon in the last uh, month because we've had the best tomato crop in several years. Was it a beautiful home? In, I mean, our, our yeah, home. Yeah, was the where did um, when did the aesthetic, the, the aesthetic begin? My father for you? had the aesthetic. Um, my mother had very good taste in, in like fabric and clothing, but um, but we lived in a three bedroom house, uh, eight of us, and uh, shared bedrooms. Um, I would say no, it was not beautiful. And it's I still pass by it every now and then in Nutley, New Jersey, to see what it's like. It still looks driver. It, it looks this Nutley. <laughs> If I'm in Clifton, I go to Nutley. You know, it's like, and I have to see. Um, but, um, but it's, um, 
but the aesthetic, uh, I, I don't know, my father liked Harris Tweed. Now, why would a man living in Nutley, New Jersey dress in white linen shirts and Harris Tweed suits? Okay? And uh, his one pair of gold cufflinks that he had inherited from his father, who probably won it in a gambling game oh, in the tavern. I love this owned. movie. I mean, it goes on and on. Um, so, no, he, my father had beautiful taste, and, and he grew the most beautiful flowers. And, I, and, I, and he had a very fine garden. You know, so, one yeah. of my questions was, and we're totally out of time, although this could go on until like noon, but what's the best flower? Not your favorite, the best flower, period. To grow? To exist in the presence of? Um, maybe the old roses, the beautifully scented old roses. Martha never disappoints. Ladies and gentlemen, Martha Stewart. Thank you. Thank you.